thank you for coming to the Bell Hook Center for our final gender talk of the semester. For those who don't know me, my name is Dr. M. Shadi Malaklu, and I have the supreme pleasure of directing this center and chairing women's gender and sexuality studies at Berea College. I want to open today by acknowledging that our center and college are located on the ancestral homelands of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, the Cherokee Nation, the Shawnee Tribe, and the Yuchi. We recognize that their material and spiritual relationships with these lands and waterways precede ours, and that their sovereignty has persisted amidst continued removal. There is no land statement that can sufficiently account for this violence, and so I will not attempt one. What I will say is that we need to do better, and that the Bell Hook Center invites you to disrupt settler systems of domination with us. The work of decolonization is a communal one, and it cannot be a metaphor. I'm so excited to welcome today's Gender Talk speaker, Dr. Tao Lei Goff, Assistant Professor of Literary Theory and Cultural History, with a joint appointment between the Department of Africana Studies and the Program in Feminist, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at Cornell University. Dr. Goff is an award-winning writer and DJ specializing in the origin stories that emerge from histories of race, um, empire, climate, and technology. Her story was featured as an experimental short film on Hulu's Initiative 29 that celebrates black history, heroes, and futurism. Writing recipes, curating exhibitions, and producing mixed media art, she explores the full range of the human sensorium in her artistic practice. She was born in London, United Kingdom, and lives and works in Manhattan. She studied English at Princeton University before earning her PhD from Yale University. Her research is rooted in literature and theories of labor that center black feminism's engagement with indigeneity and Asian diasporic racial formations. In today's talk, entitled Mother is a Mountain, feminist, Black Feminist Technologies and Sonic Ecologies, Dr. Goff tunes into Black, Indigenous, and Asian traditions of mountain, ma mountain ballads to explore the relationship between climate justice and racial justice. Listening to the life mountains give birth, listening to the life mountains give birth to, and what they have witnessed of conquest across the Americas, she proposes a way to hear the multi-layered soundtrack of the co-production that exists in the natural environment. Reflecting on her practice as a DJ and sound artist, she shares techniques and modes of sound mixing and experimentation. Looking to the reverberation of black feminist poetics on rural life in Toni Morrison's Sula and our own Bell Hooks' Appalachian Elegy, she will explore how many mountains, mountainous landscapes hold ancestral songs that echo freedom and possibility. How, she asks, can we understand quote, telling it on the mountain as a strategy of witness for a shared future. Today's respondent is the Bell Hook Center's own teacher scholar in residence, Dr. E. Gail Greenlee. Dr. Greenlee is also a co-organizer uh, co of the inaugural Bell Hook Symposium hosted at Berea College this June 16th through 18th, 2023. There are no registration fees to attend the symposium, so we hope you will join us, but do register. <laughs> and um, we're still in need of volunteers. So if you're interested in volunteering, please reach out to us. Uh, and volunteers will receive a t-shirt and other things, but, but primarily, I think the big draw is that you will be invited to a private dinner with the plenary speakers, uh, who are Joy James, uh, Alexis Pauline Gums, and the artist Allison Saar. Dr. Greenlee is a black feminist legacy keeper and a children's literature and black girlhood studies scholar with roots in Western North Carolina and rural South Carolina. She is a writer and community literacy practitioner by training, currently working on projects about black craft in Kentucky, black children in natural spaces, and art and placemaking in Appalachia. Her public humanities work focuses on curating literary and cultural programs for communities. In addition to the organizing of this summer symposium with our colleague, Dr. Megan Pfeiffer, 
Um, uh, Dr. Gail Greenlee and I co-curated this beautiful installation that you see around you, laying the groundwork for the visioning of the Bell Hook Center. Before we begin, I also want to acknowledge the hard work of my colleagues, namely our program associates, some of whom are here today, Autumn, it's there, you're still here? I think we lost it. Um, and it's, yeah? Um, and especially my administrative colleague, Kat Moses, uh, without whom none of what we do would be possible. I also want to thank the Department of African and African American Studies for its generous co-sponsorship of this event. We hope that students will consider enrolling in our cross-listed course, Theory in the Flesh, Black Feminist Theory, next spring, currently co-taught by Dr. Greenlee and our new Assistant Professor of African and African American Studies, Dr. Leanna Looney. Please join me in welcoming the immensely talented and generous Tao Lagoff to the Belhook Center for Your College. Great, thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. And I'm actually gonna start with a kind of call and response, a way to get folks engaged, um, because I'm really looking forward to the Q&A section of today. So we're gonna try out this um, app called Mentimeter. So if you have your phone with you, text um, that code um, and go to menti.com. And we're gonna see a word cloud emerge on the screen just so we can get a sense anonymously of how we're all feeling today. I know that April is the cruelest month, exciting for the pre-frosh who are deciding where they're gonna be, but for those of you who are students, I know it's time for finals and classes winding down. So I'm just excited that you're here um, to kind of give yourself some time to tune in sonically today. So we should start to see answers emerging. There we go, tired engaged, productive, <laughs> and um, you can write multiple things. And the ones that come up um, as larger on the screen will be ones where multiple people may have written the same thing. So I, I begin this way just to kind of check in with where you all are <laughs> emotionally, energy-wise. Um, yeah, it's just been great to kind of tune in to being in Kentucky. This is my first time here, but it's been such a warm welcome thanks to the Bell Hook Center. Awesome, so excited <laughs> is our largest one in the middle there, and I feel you on the exhaustion, but hopefully today we can think about sonic healing as a way to um, you know, move into the summer. <clears throat> All right, so next what I'd like you to do is to use this QR code. I know we're all familiar with them, um, thanks to the pandemic bringing us this technology back for menus and restaurants, um, but also just um, as a way of connecting quickly. So I need a bit of help from you today in terms of following this link, which hopefully will take you to the page that I set up on SoundCloud. So I'd love for you to turn up the volume on your phones and press play. Cool. Yeah, so everyone should try to do it if you can. Awesome. Wow. Okay, so we're going to take 30 seconds and just calm yourself and think about grounding. Think about the ecologies of Kentucky um, or maybe wherever your ancestral homelands might be. All right, so I'm starting 30 seconds now where you can just give yourself this time to be grounded. Okay, so pause now. Um, and I hope that, you know, this just gives us a chance to kind of check in 
with where we are emotionally. And if you could um, do one more thing on Mentimeter, uh, share how it is, and this is open-ended, that you're feeling now. Um, were there certain sounds that you noticed in this kind of sound bath and offering that I presented? Um, a lot of them actually are from Kentucky um, in terms of the forests, the woodlands here, um, the kind of nighttime symphony of the animals that are here um, and loud at night. So I'll give you a moment to answer, um, but we can also return to this question in the Q&A. All right. Activated, nostalgic. Cleansed, grounded, cacophonous. I love cacophony. <laughs> Connected to my roots. I feel my grandparents' connection to the land in Kentucky. It immediately took me to humid summer nights in Kentucky. We'll be there in a matter of months, right? Birds. I love bird watching, so I'm very excited. I brought my binoculars here. Heard bugs, lots of different bugs. Yes, cicadas. Um, I'm native from Kentucky, so it felt like home, but just a louder version. Cool, okay, dissonant. We can um, check in in the Q&A for more of the responses, but think about how easy it would be to give yourself that time, right? That was just 30 seconds. Um, and I created this um, little soundtrack just based on being here for a couple of days. And um, yeah, we can think about what it means to sculpt sound, to be surrounded by sound. And this is the way that I wanted to, in a participatory, in a call and respo response sense, open up today's convening where we'll consider how a mother can be a mountain and how bell hooks helps us to think through the black feminist ecologies and sonic technologies in order to understand that resonance. I also began, um, as you all were entering the room, um, with music that um, Gail told me about from bell hooks's um, memorial ceremony where um, enchantment the band from the 1970s and 80s uh, really held a special place in her heart. So think about burial, memorial, and the way that sound can be a kind of sacred offering. Sound can be healing. And if we consider that, um, you know, I played for you the sounds of the forest at night, I've actually welcomed you into a kind of practice that I've been taking part in called Moonrise. So it's been a night writing circle um, on pause for now, but we're going to start again in the summer where I open up a Zoom room and then people from all over the world are welcome at midnight um, to write. So just free writing. <laughs> so I'll definitely let you all know about it in the future. But we listen to a similar kind of soundtrack with all these crickets and cicadas. And it's great to just free write. No cameras, no judgment. Um, and what I want to suggest is that there's a kind of sacred design in sound that we should sit with more often. I was just recently in the beginning of this month at Dr. Ruha Benjamin's course in Princeton on world building as black studies method. And in the way that Dr. Benjamin talks about race and technology, I add the question of climate through the work that I'm doing at Dark Laboratory, which investigates the question of stolen land and stolen life. So thanks to Shadi, Thanks to Gail, thanks to Kat, thanks to all of the people that I just met in the room today, because there is a call and response that I'm excited for, especially with the with Dr. Greenlee. And um, yeah, I heard that these are the old mountains and that the Rockies are the new mountains. So I'd love to kind of discuss that in the Q&A. But it's clear to me that there are echoes of Appalachia that reverberate from Black Mountain in North Carolina, which Gail told me about to the Blue Mountains in Jamaica, where I've done a lot of research, to Montpellier in Martinique, to Mauna Kea in Hawaii, to Victoria's Peak in Hong Kong. 
These sacred geographies across the globe are the places where people have understood that the mountain is an ancestor. The mountain is a god. The mountain is a mother. It is life-giving. It holds our fight songs of resilience, but also our lullabies, our ballads, and our gossip. Much of the Black diaspora experience is a dialogue and a dance with death, a call and response. From the future to the past, this is the time scale of Black temporality. And a ring shout happens when the saints come marching, and whether it's the choreography of the limbo or of the tango, there is to be no idle mourning. And these are the words of Shirley Graham Du Bois. So we celebrate life at Black funerals and in the second line. And as we consider the toll of the pandemic and the delayed grieving, as well as the delayed funerals, um, I'm led to think about the kind of amnesia that we currently are in, considering who we have lost over this period. So Black British thinker Paul Gilroy famously theorized the Black experience as antiphonal in his 1992 book, The Black Atlantic. And instead of focusing on the triangular trade, he focused on the resonance from Europe by Black people to the Americas, to West Africa. And this leads me to ask, what about the resonance of mountain ranges? And in the work of theorist Bell Hooks in the poetics and what she modeled, especially in teaching to transgress, there is an investigation that we're going to make today in terms of mountains as mothers. So through Black eco-feminist elegies and odes to nature, we'll listen for how topography narrates. Because it is my firm belief that in geology, we can find our genealogy written. So I've been writing about mountains for some time now. And um, just wanted to thank whoever did the poster design, um, just for those labors that go into everything too. But these images on the screen are related to my teenage experience in suburban New Jersey. So I didn't think much of mountains then or of the fact that our high school mascot in West Orange, New Jersey was a mountaineer. It seemed boring to me. <laughs> our middle school mascot was the Rough Riders, which I didn't know much of the history about. But Theodore Roosevelt's Band of Thieves um, has a lot to tell us about white conquest and the American myth that needs to anxiously repeat itself in hopes of becoming true. So even though my high school was located at Eagle Rock, I had never once considered the Lenape, even with place names like Wachung, hidden in plain sight. There is an erasure, a citation as erasure, as most liberal land acknowledgments perform. So Kentucky, as some of you may know, is a native word. Its lineage is uncertain, but it may be Iroquois, so Haudenosaunee or Algonquin. Jamaica, too, is a native word. The Caribs of the Caribbean are a native people, but they call themselves the Kalinago. Bell Hooks gave us this language in Appalachian Elegy when she said, we a marooned mountain people, backwood souls, we know how to live on little. This resonates with maroonage in Jamaica um, <clears throat> and the fact that black and indigenous peoples there um, survived the Spanish incursions and the British incursions. She wrote these words long before the problematic hillbilly elegy <laughs> And that's such a different register of a kind of post-Confederate resentment, which unfortunately amplifies and we're anticipating what this may mean in the fall of 2024. But I offer this lecture in sound bath as a kind of climate elegy for what we're losing and as an ode to mountains as mothers. And not in a gendered sense for those assigned female at birth or who may or may not have uteruses, but all, also to think about what it means to mother as a verb, and all of the people who fit under that category of nurturing, of caring, of tending, of parenting. So in musical genres, what I want to think about today is the ways in which there's a kind of shame that gets implied in country, backwater, backwoods, the kind of derision of hillbilly is something that actually resonates differently in Black ecologies. And in the hinterlands across mountain ranges, 
beyond the boundaries of the nation state, there is a call to go tell it on the mountain. So enslaved people knew where to stand in mountains, how to throw their voices, and who would receive those messages of freedom. Therefore, the mountains are a technology of black survival. Indigenous Mexicans knew this too, and I learned this most recently at Teotihuacan. The architecture of the sacred is there in our cosmologies, and it's a form of early telecommunications that brought messages far and wide. And this is why the British banned drumming, so African drumming in the hills and in the mountains. So not exactly yodeling, but there is a kind of primal code that is about this kind of acoustics that we can hear in the military technology of Africans who became Maroons and the strategic warfare of the Ashanti, of the Koromanti, and it frightened the British. They also could not dance, so <laughs> they were challenged. Um, Edward Glissant and Frantz Fanon knew this too, obeying the volcano in Martinique, Le Souffrier, and mountain ballads and hills, hill songs encode encrypted messages from the future to the past, the past to the future. So the oceanic frame of the Black Atlantic and the Chinese Pacific has long structured my work um, since I became an instructor at universities in 2011, and I realized I took the mountains for granted, perhaps like one takes a mother for granted. I didn't consider that my mother's mother's people had been buried in the mountains for generations. And a chapter of the forthcoming book I'm writing after Eden addresses this mountain lineage and maroonage in Jamaica, but also tomb sweeping in the mountains of southeastern China and Cantonese whispers that are there. So the thesis of my book is simple. The climate crisis has always been a racial crisis. And this is going to be a trade book, and I'm inspired by Bell Hooks, who published close to 40 books, both trade and academic, because she knew the urgency for black feminists to write in different registers, even if universities will not recognize this work right now. <laughs> but buried in mountains, um, on mountaintops are plots of land where maroons have sung dirges um, and chants that I believe echo here to Appalachia, to mountain haulers here. And there's a kind of dialogue that we can even see between Stuart Hall, Paul Gilroy, and Bell Hooks that is really exciting for me because he too, right? He never published a book during his lifetime. He wrote many essays, but there's a kind of posthumous critique that I think we should reckon with. And um, with all these different registers, as a DJ, I think about levels. So the mid, the low, the high, different frequencies and how blackness is a method of mixing, of juggling, of beat matching, of transitioning. Um, and the mountain song is one of the genres through which we can hear a transnational ballad of sovereignty. So my research has taken me to these mountaintops, to the Blue Mountains in Jamaica, where the famous coffee comes from, but most Jamaicans have never tasted it. They cannot afford to buy it or to drink it. Um, and it's interesting that this site is actually a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And I wanted to let you all know that December 11th is actually um, the International Mountain Day. So maybe there's an opportunity to do something later in the year um, together. And the theme this year was Women Move Mountains. So I um, have a work of art that is on display in Kingston that includes a sound installation. So I don't have time during the talk to play it, but if you want to hear it during the q and I'd be happy to share it. But it's an echo of different mountain um, sounds, similar to what you heard in the beginning, and it accompanies the painting that I made to honor Queen Nanny of the Maroons, to honor the way that she fought against the British, to honor the way that she killed them with a no, as I put it. You might know the um, Mr. Vega song, Heads High, where he talks about killing them with a no and women saying no. Nanny refused to sign the treaty. Grandy Nanny refused to return runaway enslaved people to the British, to plantations in Jamaica. So through her, I've been searching for mountain ballads and methods of hill songs. And I found them in the Hakka Chinese traditions of my ancestors there and in Hong Kong who farmed because though most Chinese women had their feet bound, Hakka women did not. 
and they were forced to do agricultural work. And in it, they found ways to gossip with each other. And this traveled, this form of storytelling across hills and mountains because they were cultivators and they knew how to hide these messages and where to stand. So minorities in China today suffer isolation and persecution. And we have to think about how isolation protects, but it is also putting people at risk in certain ways. And I've had the privilege to find my ancestral homelands within southeastern China in Shenzhen. And I didn't know that it was going to be this mountainous territory that very much um, mirrors what we see in Hong Kong. And it also mirrors the descent of the Scottish Highlands. It mirrors the Jamaican place names that the British used for Hong Kong, for Scotland, <laughs> um, for all of these colonized people where they were seeing the same thing. So Arthur's seat, which is in Edinburgh, is also in Jamaica. And that's where I can hear this kind of reverberation. In visual art, there is a visceral and powerful critique, perhaps more urgently expressed than what academics might be doing in the so-called geological term. Botswanan artist Pamela Fatsimo Sundstrom, who I was invited to speak with in September at Gallery Lebong in New York, told me about mourning and mythology in her painting. There's a colonial critique of mountains that she gives us, which is also a critique of extractive capitalism and mining in Africa. She creates an altar named Esme, who is an African trickster. When we had the talk in September, Queen Elizabeth had just died, but we lingered on the memory of Sundstrom's mother and the elegiac painting. The battle of two years facing cancer led me to think about how her mother became a mountain in the work. A mother, a mountain. A mountain, a mother. A mother, a mountain. A mountain, a mother. To lose your mother is a call and response that Sadia Hartman tells us about the time of slavery and the transatlantic slave route in her famous book. Inspired by these philosophical questions, I've written about geology as philosophy, and in 2018, I published this essay called Racial, On Racial Sedimentation that looks at the layered process of bedrock formation for African, South Pacific indigenous, and Chinese labor in the 19th century. And I was invited by geoscientists of color last summer in DC to give a keynote on this question. And for them, for scientists, this question of the decay of bones, of coal, of charcoal, was an exciting one that we were able to, to connect on, even though I'm based in the humanities. And the reason is, is that there's a soundtrack, which is also a dirge that converges when we consider black life and native life in the Americas. When I was a senior in college, I was lucky to be a student of Toni Morrison. And it was there that I understood the United States and the Western hemisphere to be a haunted house. So the dirge of the architecture of that house is one we can think about in Beloved. It is a loud um, dirge, and it's also a potential monument for sonic healing. So in 2021, I was invited to teach an architecture course at Cornell, and with 12 graduate students, I produced a sound sculpture called Dirge. So it's this multimedia virtual reality rendition, and with students coming from Nigeria, Nepal, and Tuscarora Nation, we converged Haudenosaunee echoes with African-American spirituality and thought about the Underground Railroad, its geographies, and the carceral territory of upstate New York in Ithaca, where Cornell is located. So if we turn to a genealogy of um, texts that comprise the syllabus, there are so many more if we add Black Appalachia to this question. And um, Sula by Toni Morrison, the way she talks about the poetry of the bottom, is very exciting when we consider the fertility of the land and also what Nikki Giovanni has written about in terms of blackness and um, claiming Appalachia. So I've been experimenting with different sounds and um, thinking about dirges. Um, so in terms of bluegrass music, I'll admit that my first introduction was as a child through the, the movie Oh Brother, 
But the song Oh Death on that soundtrack really stuck with me. And then I discovered that Bessie Jones and Vera Hall, um, being from Alabama and I believe Georgia, have really beautiful renditions. So I layered them together as another kind of sonic offering. So we start with the Ralph family. Okay, so I'll pause it there, but you get a sense of what I'm trying to layer here. And this takes me to um, the question of love and theft, right? But I ask, is it love really, though? Um, this theft, because there's a kind of American love that's like, oh, I love your shoes, which means I want your shoes. Give, give them to me. Right. And black and indigenous people know that this possessive American love is something to be terrified of. Um, what does it mean if I say I love your hair? Um, Bell Hooks taught us all about love in her writing. And in this quotation, she emphasizes spiritual life. So it's really amazing to see the sacred architecture of the chapel here. And she says to remain open to love as part of academic survival. She also talks about how opposite spirituality is to this kind of academic work. And I think it's just really powerful the way that both she and Stuart Hall modeled pedagogy, which often we're taught not to center as researchers, even though we're here, you know, teaching every day. So in teaching to transgress, um, I'll also just highlight these pages have been really meaningful in terms of how she describes evaluation and what it meant for her to get tenure at Oberlin College. Um, and actually that it was a bit of a crisis <laughs> because she knew she was going to get it. But what did that mean for her? OK, so the final quote from her work is from Appalachian Elegy, Poetry in Place. And she says, living by those Appalachian values, living with integrity, I am able to return to my native place. And I want to emphasize here that she says, while I do not claim an identity as Appalachian, I do claim a solidarity, a sense of belonging, belonging that makes me one with the Appalachian past of my ancestors, Black, Native American, and White, all people of one blood. So here, what I'd like to say is that she models something for us, right, about how to claim this ancestry, these identities, but still to be a black woman and to claim feminism as something of one blood. Um, when she passed away, I was asked to write two obituaries, and it was really a ritual act of rereading as mourning that took over the moment in December of 2021. And I didn't realize until after the fact that I actually had COVID. I wrote all through the night because of these deadlines. And it actually was a kind of mourning that reminded me that we do not mourn in isolation. And Pamela Fetsimo Sundstrom shows us this in these shades of blue. So I would like to say for all of you here, wherever you're from, tune into the frequencies of mountains of your ancestral geographies. So whether it's the Scottish Highlands or the Himalayas, these supposedly colonized mountains could never be fully conquered. The mountain is a mother, not based on blood or biology, but because the land is a pact. So in this call and response, we must ask ourselves, as the mountain protects us, who will protect the mountains from us? Between the valley and the peak, there is no actual binary from the ridge to the reef between summits and the deers of the ocean. We must tune into the sovereign soundtracks of what glaciers know and what they witnessed when they became lakes. There are many rivers to cross, 
rivers and streams that run through mountains, purifying the water and aquifers from deep within. Mountains bear witness. They are also life-giving. And at times they are merciless if we consider the volcano. In these cycles of fertility, ash fertilizes the land, and so do the remains of our dead, because the land is a pact. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I don't think I'm on. Hello. Yes, it's green. Okay, cool. Um, oh, wait, maybe I, it's not green now. What? Is it still green? Is it still green? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's green. <laughs> so my comments are personal, which I've shared with um, Tao before she got started, and so I hope I don't cry. But if so, it's healing. Um, so these are musings and meditations. We actually talked last Friday, and one of the things that you said was, "What stories are sedimented in the land?" What and we were talking about burials and remembrances. And so I don't believe in coincidences. I happen to have been at my mother's house in Black Mountain. And I, as I shared with you, I was looking out the window and I could see my Uncle Marvin's house. And he passed about seven years ago, but he built that house that he and my dad's sister, my Aunt Lean, lived in. Now, um, a young white family with children live in that home, right? And so I'm thinking about him in that space when I can actually see the backyard and see the kids running around. On the flip side of my mom's street is my Aunt Johanna's house, and she passed when I was a college sophomore, I believe. So I'm thinking about these mountains, this mountain community that was a thriving black community and now is populated with multi-million dollar homes and folk who have come from New York and Florida. And so there's a kind of development and gentrification that's happening in this mountain space that was predominantly rural and mountainous and populated with my people. Um, and I'm thinking about Uncle Marvin and how he said, when I go, he told this to my younger sister, when I go, no one will know that we were here. No one will know that we were here. And I'm thinking about the ballad as a kind of storytelling, typically associated with British um, traditions, maybe Scottish traditions, not so much African, although they are definitely there, even if we're not using the ballad as a term. And so I'm just thinking about the stories and how do the stories pass on. Um, Lucille Clifton, who's a poet, has a poem called Listen, Children. And in it, she says, um, pa pass this on, pass this on. So how are these stories being passed on, particularly when the people who have sung these songs or told these stories are no longer um, in this landscape? And so I moved from Black Mountain on my way to, a, it was a pit stop, on my way to rural South Carolina, and I've brought some pictures, which you are welcome to, uh, I wanted you to see them because we've had this conversation, to my Aunt Bibi's funeral. She just passed, and her um, service, her homegoing service, was um, definitely a homegoing. It was definitely a celebration um, and not just a somber event. But it's in rural South Carolina in the midst of a tobacco community field um, or a Mr. Farming Communities, primarily tobacco, soybeans now, and some other crops. And that brought me to Belle and Appalachian Elegy because she actually writes about tobacco. Um, Any Brown, who helped to co-curate this installation and who was our Bell Hook Scholar or artist in residence, and I are working on a project about black craft. And it took us to Lincoln Institute right outside Louisville in the midst of what was 440 some acres of black farmland. And one of our guides said something about tobacco being here. And I was like, what? No, I'm from the tobacco state. What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. South Carolina and North Carolina. He was like, no, it was, and he was naming these different companies, right? And so again, I'm thinking about the erasure of these crops, erasure of people. And Bell even writes, tobacco leaves green, yellow, brown, plant of sacred power, shining beauty, return to Appalachia, make your face known. So what is lost in that particular story of that particular um, plant 
and that history of that plant as being cultivated, as being capitalized upon, as being the source of enslavement of so many people, um, as also being part of sacred rituals of indigenous people, what does that mean for that crop to no longer be in that physical space? Where's the trace? And I'm using, thinking of Lorette uh, Savoy's book, Trace, about race and connection to landscape. I'm also thinking about a mentor of mine, Daniel Black, who just came out with a book called Black on Black, Resilience and Brilliance in America. And he was talking about lynching and the effect of lynching on landscape and like what happens to the tree, the tree that we use for shade, the tree that we use perhaps even for fruit. What happens when that tree then becomes the site of death and murder? And what happens to that land that we have rested on, that we have walked on, that we've cultivated, but now it's the land that's holding blood at the site of these, um, these violent acts. And so I'm still thinking what song, what story, what history is the land telling us, or what is the silence, our, our lack of ability to witness and to hear that language telling us. It's also bringing me to um, my particular interest, which is Black Appalachian or Afro-Latin literature, particularly Afro-Latin children's literature. Yes, there is a thing. Um, and there's one story by a gentleman named John Von Streeter, published in 1972 called Home is Over These Mountains. And it tells a story, it's actually true, of his childhood and his four siblings and how they were forced out of Mississippi up through Tennessee because of, quote, the anger of a white man. So there's this backstory about white supremacist violence that is causing this migration, or what I like to call this movement of black people through um, the Afro-Latin diaspora, actually. It also brings me to Virginia Hamilton's book, published in 1974, M.C. Huggins, Higgins the Great. I don't know if anybody ever read that in middle school, but it's set here in Kentucky. It's a coming of age story. It deals with mountaintop removal and this young boy seeing this extractive process happening in the land. It also has a moment where there is a person from the city who wants to come and talk to his mother, the young boy's mother, because he hears she can sing. And she has these songs that he wants to record them. He wants to keep them and record them and sell them, ultimately. So again, I'm thinking about the tension of recording history, the extractive process of history, um, of photography even, too, as a white supremacist, capitalist, patriarchal project, as Bell would say. And so I guess the thing I'll leave you with are just a few words that resonated with me from your talk. Sculpt sound, a sacred design and sound, future past, past future, buried in the mountains. And my question to you before we open it up to everyone is, so how do you deal with this tension between the extractive historical process that has been violent mm -hmm. and then also the promise of what you're naming as a Black feminist digital practice of liberation? Thank you. Thank you. So I guess we're going to open it up for questions. Or yeah. What? Question conversation. Next. Okay. So yeah, thank you. That's such a powerful offering and response, as well as these photographs being here. Um, it's just very, very special to see the shrine for bell hooks there as well, um, and to to think about home going services and what we can bring as offerings, whether libations or just ways to to sit with what is buried in the mountains. So thank you, Gail, for just being so open <laughs> with that, because it's not easy. And I think as much as there's intergenerational trauma, there's also intergenerational healing. And I just I really love this question about extraction and extractive capitalism. So I didn't even know about mountaintop removal, but I think this takes us into the territory of coal and the climate question. Um, so yeah, there's so much to unpack in terms of tobacco and all of this. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to open it up to um, questions. Yes, Shadi? Are you kidding me? <laughs> wow, 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 wow. <laughs> Wow. wow, wow. 
so much to unpack in both of those narratives because we had an actual person like in a suit like a map like a mountaineer we just thought it was the worst mascot others were like the jaguars and so much to unpack especially being in the boone um tavern <laughs> okay wow <laughs> Thank you. So I love to listen to isolated vocals. If you like put it into YouTube, isolated vocals, you'll find um, yeah songs in which they've uploaded them. So in particular, Marvin Gaye, I think, is an incredible person to listen to with isolated vocals. So for sexual healing, in particular, I've played around with the 808 and the kind of electronic sounds of, let's say, you know, blackness in the 1980s. But there's also a kind of resonance of the choir. So as much as there's the profane, there's always the sacred in terms of the black church and gospel choirs. Um, and I feel like it's about the vibrations. It's about the energy, even in a space, or especially in a space like this, where you're paying attention to sound. And I feel it through the architecture. So even if it's the rugs that absorb sound in a certain way. Um, and yeah, I just feel that our culture is so ocular centric. So the question is, how as a DJ can I put sound first? And I've written about this in an essay called um, Listening Underwater, Silence as Fermentation. So in that, <laughs> I think about the high pass filter, which is that sound where sound effects on the DJ controller, where it sounds like maybe there's a party next door or you're listening underwater. And that's why I find the sound bath, like what I began with as a method to be really exciting because of that augmentation of sound, that distortion of sound. But it is also always a question of how do you put sound first? And through the sound sculpture, I try to kind of leave with the primacy of sound, but we do also have visual um, effects as part of the argument. But in teaching, I ask my students to think first about sound because it always seems to be secondary. But there's a kind of European or Western hierarchy of the five senses. But we all know there's so many more senses. <laughs> We all know that there's synesthesia. So I try to encourage my students to, to think through color, and I can see that and feel that here. So it's actually more about the frequencies and tuning in um, and embracing all of the senses. But what does it mean to begin with sound? And I think it requires a kind of humility and listening and tuning in. Oh, thank you. I kind of think of you do close reading, but what about deep listening? And just like sitting with what is here, the birds, everything. How does that fit within the request for the word? Like, if you have the word. Well, I think it's part of a feminist call and response in pedagogy that's not just like a top down lecture, it requires more than one person. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have some friends here in Korea that um, there's this like um, 
farming community. Um, there's a place called Deer Creek, um, which is just about like 20 minutes outside of town. It's beautiful. It's about like two and a half followers in the south, and the most wonderful people live there. And they have all these like um, intentional like um, permaculture farms. So yeah. this idea of like sustainable farming about regenerative practices. Oh. Um, my friends like they have a spring on their land, you know, and so like the tap water at their home is spring water. Um, wow. And it's so beautiful. And I never until this moment considered that like practice of permaculture is like radical feminist anti-capitalist mm-hmm. function. But now I'm seeing in the way that um my friend Joanna incredible she always talks about being a steward of the land of um having the, uh I've always considered that humans are meant to be by the land, but mm-hmm. really there's this um, this action where um, we nurture the land and then it nurtures us and that relationship that we can build. So I've just been thinking about um, my friends that have these amazing farms and how odd, like ra- truly radical they are and that um, that they are not only Denying that this capitalist function and, and establishing like a self sustaining lifestyle, mm-hmm. um, but also in uh, refusing to to engage in these extractive practices that are like very um, just like pro beneficial relationship. And I it also makes so much sense to me to think of the mountains as mother. Um, I wrote a poem actually when I was on my friend's land. Um, and it was just kind of like meditation in his cabin, um, and and one of the last lines that I, I say, deep within the womb of the mountain, I am safe. Mm. And that right now, I'm fully wow. understanding what that means to me and where that comes from. Um, wow. And and this idea that like uh, ev- everywhere is is the garden of Eden. Mm-hmm. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I feel like poetry is appropriate. Which is why Bell Hooks's, you know, Appalachian Elegy is a collection of poems, because it's about distilling that emotion and understanding, and understanding that there's water within mountains, <laughs> that they're so life-giving, um, whether they arise from tectonic plates shifting or whether they, you know, grow out of the ocean as volcanoes. There's so many different ways that we can sit with geological time and how profound it is. So that's why in the book After Eden, I'm really sitting with that story and what is next? Because I think we have to refuse to give up in terms of climate crisis being over or um, a fait accompli. Really, it is the fact of the matter that there are regenerative agriculture solutions to be created by students like you all here. At Berea. Um, so, you know, in my lab, we have biotechnologists thinking about these questions. There's definitely answers. Um, we just have to come in with a kind of humility and method that is looking on a grander scale. So if we think about the Cherokee, the Chickasaw, the Shawnee who are here, if we think about Haudenosaunee principles of seven generations, that has to be part of how we're thinking of regenerative agriculture. And the answers are here. But we have to listen to the farmers. We have to sit with the soil. And as you said, Gail, I feel like the blood in the soil is really important to just like understand and to think about the haptic texture of what that means. And also our burial. As people of African descent, we're generations here. (laughs) Like maybe we're not native to here, maybe we are, but also what does it mean to become part of that land as fertilizer? And what does it mean that that was intended by people like Ralph Waldo Emerson, <laughs> who said that we should lie down and become fertilizer, people of color, to, to fertilize the land um, for the more extensive or white races? Um, what does it mean to hold him up as a hero when um, there's such a complicated history <laughs> Of how we've been used. Yeah. And we're going to throw right to the So, values of the Christian 
I'm thinking about the ways in which this like land back kind of movement is such a white kind of like fetishization of going back to nature, where the people that are made co equal with nature who are mad at the middle issues, right? But that like that these are these are racial justice issues. A billion black and girls is seen as a hunt for lack of a better term. You know what that No. <laughs> In that process, and so it's like excluding a lot of marginalized communities from the working communities that have that history. Um, so I do like that you bring that up, like, as one way of thinking about the history of the farmer and going back to the land. And there are many, like, small ways and big ways that we can do this work. So if it's aquaponics or if it's gardening, if it's these kinds of things, it all adds up. And we should also consider that. West African people were targeted for being cultiv cultivators of the land in West Africa. So the, the Europeans knew that and intentionally brought them here to do that labor. So both in native traditions, but also in African traditions, there are these solutions of regenerative agriculture. And it's just like, what does it mean to not center extraction, right? And extractive practices. So I, I feel like extraction when it comes to the Smithsonian, <laughs> for example, to answer your question, Gail, um, I'm so glad that we have these recordings. So Vera Hall, you know, different maroon drumming. But when I think about the process of the white anthropologist who records, <laughs> I have to think about the question of the theft. But also, like, for us as black scholars today, like, what are we doing that's different? And it's very different because of these pictures that you brought here today. So there is a kind of, I think, practice of extraction through citations that takes place that troubles me when I see a kind of synthesis of black thought, <laughs> of black women, um, of black thinkers who've been ignored for decades, and people who kind of Columbus and sort of synthesize all of that knowledge and take those conclusions as if we haven't always been talking about them forever. So there's just multiple registers of extraction both in terms of coal mining, in terms of, yeah, the extractive practice of academia <laughs> that makes so much possible, but also like takes so much away from us on a daily basis that, um, yeah, we have to continue to think about what if there was actually abundance, not scarcity, at the center of this philosophy? And what if you don't need a huge grant to practice regenerative agriculture? What if it begins with buying a plant and really kind of tuning in and finding others who want to do this work together. So that's what I'm trying to do with my lab. But yeah, it's hard. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think talking to all of you gives me hope that we just need to sing across our different mountains to connect because maybe we're isolated. Maybe I'm trying to do this in New York and you're doing it here in Kentucky, but we never met until this really generous invitation. Thank you.